Today, we, we start a brand new series, uh, and this series is called A Thrill of Hope. It's a three-week Christmas series as we kind of head into uh, the Christmas season, and, and this is what I felt the Lord wanted me to do, is to take three weeks to focus on the three gifts that these wise men brought to Jesus uh, on Christmas morning, the, the, the story that we celebrate. Uh, and, and what I want to do is take some time through this series to look at the three gifts that were brought. You see, because each gift that these wise men brought to Jesus was not random, but instead represented something significant. It represented hope to a hopeless situation. It was the thrill of hope. And for this series, we'll be looking at the birth of Jesus, the story of the birth of Jesus through the perspective of the gospel of Matthew. And and before I read the story to you, I just want to set this up a little bit. Now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and he was born uh, during the the reign of King Herod, and we'll talk more about that later in the series, but he was born in Bethlehem, and there were wise men that traveled following this prophecy of a north star that would lead them to the savior of the world, these wise men. The Bible also refers to them as the magi. So these magi or wise men followed this star and led them to Jesus. Now, many of you, I'm sure here, have a manger scene set up in your house. Show of hands, how many of you have a manger scene set up in your house? How many of y'all have a couple manger scenes set up in your house? All right, yeah, so do I. And a staple in that manger scene is the three wise men, right? The three wise men you see always there with their gifts, right next to Jesus with their camels. It's always a part of the manger scene. And I was just, for Thanksgiving, I was at my, my brother and sister-in-law's house, and they had this, like, like elaborate, like, how many of you got an elaborate you know, manger scene with like multiple characters. Like, it was like a crowd there. You're like, I didn't even know there was, I didn't know there was so many people there at the birth of Jesus, but, uh, but there's like kids and like all sorts of fun things, you know? Uh, and, and, and I'm looking and I'm like counting the wise men because I'm the pastor. I'm like, is this manger scene biblical, you know? And I'm like, one, two, where's the third? Where's the third magi, you know? And I said, bro, where is, you're, it's way off, man. Where is it? Where's your third person? And he's like, I, I don't get lost? I don't know. He just, we lost him. And so my brother's man you're seeing only has two wise men, so it's completely inaccurate. But that doesn't matter. Well, for all of us, we have three wise men, right, as a part of our manger scene. Now, to spoil your uh, traditions, tradition tells us that there probably more than likely pretty much was not three wise men. There were more than likely a dozen, a couple dozen, maybe even a hundred, a couple hundred wise men that showed up to this, to this encounter to meet Jesus, which is kind of crazy and it kind of messes with your mind a little bit. But then you wonder, well, why is there always three wise men on camels? And that's because there were what? Three gifts. So it's always represented three gifts. We do know they brought three gifts. We don't know how many there were, but we do know they brought three gifts. Here's what we do know about the wise men. We know that the wise men were intelligent They were wealthy, and they were desperate to meet the Savior of the world. So here's our passage. Matthew 2, 10 and 11 says, When they saw the star, these wise men, they're filled with joy. It was this prophecy. They're excited. It finally is happening. So they followed it. They entered into the house and saw not a baby, but a child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped this child. (laughs) Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, to to, to us, these gifts that these wise men brought, they seem to be pretty odd and unusual. You would bring a child some myrrh. You know, you don't even know what that is yet, but some myrrh, okay? But in reality, these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they were practical, they were valuable, and they were deeply spiritual, But Bible scholars agree that these gifts were not only useful and practical, but they were also significant. They demonstrated the hope that Jesus was to bring into the world. Gold, signifying that Jesus is the king of kings. Myrrh, signifying that Jesus is our suffering servant. And frankincense, signifying that Jesus is our high priest. Throughout the series, I'm going to go through those three gifts And we can learn together what these gifts are, what they represented to Jesus, and how it applies to us. So today I want to kick off this series with the first gift of frankincense. 
frankincense. Now, I don't know if you know anything about frankincense. I definitely did not, so I did some research. Here's what we do know. It is, it, it is an oil. <laughs> How many of y'all have some frankincense in the essential oil cabinet, Okay. I know a lot of people actually have some frankincense, right? So look how spiritual you are. Man, you are next level. This oil, it serves many purposes. It's known as liquid gold, liquid gold for its healing purposes. Here's what frankincense is, and I struggle to read this because I pulled it off of Google and I have no idea what these words represent. It has an antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, and analogistic. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate it. (laughs) Analgesic? Analgesic. No idea what that means. And as such, prescribed for its various ailments, including indigestion, wound dressing and healing, coughs, and other respiratory disorders. That's what frankincense does. What does that mean? I have no idea what it means. But I do know (laughs) that it's Vicks. That's, That's a good one, yeah. Man, that's funny. <laughs> that's right, yeah. But what I do know is that it's extremely expensive and it's, it's very productive. It's effective. It's useful. So it's used for its healing purposes. But also, check this out, frankincense was used by the priests in the Old Testament. They would, they would put the frankincense oil in, in a... In a, in a cylinder, if you will, and they would burn that with the incense, and as the incense rose up, it was as if they are lifting the prayers of the people up to God. So it was used for these spiritual purposes as well. So, so for these reasons, <clears throat> these wise men brought this gift of frankincense, giving it to Jesus to symbolize that he is our high priest. And that's what I want to talk about today. So if you're taking message notes, here's the title. This is what frankincense is. It represents Jesus, our high priest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Would you speak to our hearts today about who Jesus is as our high priest? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, I want to read the second part of that verse once again, our theme verse, verse 11. These wise men, they entered the house. They saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I don't know about you, but when my children were born, nobody showed up to the hospital with a treasure chest ready to give my children some gold, all right? I, I guess I have the wrong friends. I don't really know. But, but that would be incredible if you had someone showing up to the birth of your children to give you some gold, right? Now, I, I didn't receive that. You probably didn't either. But can we all agree that baby gifts today are on a whole other level, <laughs> Have you, have you tried shopping for a, a pregnant friend recently or gone to a baby shower? These gifts that these kids are getting are incredible. I did some, I did some research. I just wanted to see, like, what is actually out there? I, I Googled this. I found, you can buy a, today, a $1,500 stroller. I found a common, just ordinary, $12,000 crib. And I, this is Google, just like first things I saw. And I found an $800 high chair. Now, I don't know who are buying these gifts for their friends. Like, that's the kind of friend I want, you know? And so I just like, okay, obviously that's way out of my price range. If I was going to buy a gift, like Lisette's pregnant, uh, who's on our team, and, and her baby's due this month. And I'm like, okay, let's get her a gift. So I went on a Google. Here's some stuff you can get, you can get these kids today. Look at that. <laughs> Whoa, look at that one. That's just like, you can buy a mop, you can buy, or a burrito, you know? Or burrito. I mean, (laughs) that's more my speed for sure. Way better humor for sure. But here's what I discovered. We don't buy gifts for kids. We buy them for the parents because that burrito was not for that kid. That is for the humor of the parents, right? And unlike the gifts given today, these wise men, they brought gifts to Jesus, not to the parents. They brought the gifts to Jesus. And these gifts were not only practical and useful, they were deeply spiritual. They had a purpose. See, they brought frankincense, which signified Jesus as the high priest. So what were they saying in giving Jesus some essential oil? What are they saying? Jesus, you're the high priest. Now, some of you are thinking, high priest, I thought we're not Catholic, and we're not. But 
back in the day, in biblical days, the religious leaders were called priests. So, so here's what we know, that priests in Scripture... They served, and this is key for you to understand this message today, they served one role with two primary functions. I want to show it to you. The role of the priests were this, to represent the people to God, and the functions are this. Priests made sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, and here's the second thing. The priests prayed prayers on behalf of the people to God. So, so one role, they are to represent the people to God. And they did so by making sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins for people and also by praying to God for the people. This is what the priests represent in the day. So today, here's the message that Jesus is our high priest. This is what frankincense represents. It's still the same two purposes. I want to show it to you today. Here's the first thing. Jesus as our high priest, this is his first function he doesn't make sacrifices. He is the sacrifice. He, he, he sacrificed himself for us. Now, now in, in Old Testament Bible days, you had, you had priests and you had a high priest, the high priest. He's the man. He's the one in charge. He's essentially the leader who did the ceremonies. Now, the role of this singular high priest was to make sacrifices before God for the forgiveness of man and in Jesus, who is our high priest, which frankincense represents, Jesus is our high priest who made himself a sacrifice for the forgiveness of man. Now, this goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve sinned against God. There was not sin until Adam and Eve entered the picture, and now sin is present. When that sin took place, two forces were at work. And I think you would see this in your life as well today. When sin is present, here's what's happening. Two things at work. There's the sinfulness of mankind and the holiness of God. Two, two things, two forces, two things at war. The sin of man, the desire to sin, the desire to, to commit sin, to do what you want to do, to be selfish, to sin. And the thing you're combating against is the holiness of God. This is what happened in the, the beginning in the, in the Garden of Eden, and it happens today as well. Now, today in our culture, we refuse to acknowledge anything as sin. Now, who's to tell me that I'm sinning? Here's one that, that many people love. It's my truth. My truth. Like, it's like you're a baby and saying that, you know. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. What's true for me is good for me. These are excuses that we make as a culture to refuse to acknowledge sin. It's, it's my truth. It's my truth. And one person said this, sin is an outdated term used for children to trick them into being good. That's how we view sin today. And here's the challenge that we face. Sin is real. And we must realize the consequences and the weight of our sin. Because we teach this to our kids, at least we should, sin has consequences. If you do something bad, there's a consequence to your action. Sin has consequences. However, this is what you have to understand for today. If we don't understand the holiness of God, then we will always have a casual approach to sin. If we refuse to acknowledge the holiness, the weight of God, then we'll just be nonchalant. It's just, it's just sin. What's the big deal? But God is holy. And what, is, what does it mean for God to be holy? This word holy in the Greek is this word, Greek word hagios, which means separate. God is separate. There is no one like him. He is flawless. He is perfect. He lacks nothing. He needs nothing. He stands alone. He is separate. So what we have to understand is that the holiness of God is not an attribute of God which is what we do. But the holiness of God is not an attribute of God. Holiness of God is the perfection of all of his attributes. Meaning this, his power is holy. His grace is holy. His mercy is holy. It's the fact that he is separate that makes him worthy of our praise and worthy of our devotion. He is holy. We're not. We're sinful. 
The scripture teaches us that we were born that way. We were born sinful and separate from God. It's our sin that broke fellowship with God. And because he is separate, because he is holy, check this out. This is the problem. He can't be united with sin. Because he's holy and we are not, he, can be uni- he cannot be united to sin. This is the problem. You see, God hates sin because it's everything that he's not. Sin breaks fellowship and intimacy with God. So this is the reality that we face today. We have sinful man and we have holy God who cannot be tied to sin because he's separate. So we needed a way to restore the intimacy with God. We needed a way back to the Father, enter in the role of the high priest. In Bible days, once a year, the high priest and the high priest alone would sacrifice on behalf of the people before God to make atonement for the sins of man. So the role of the high priest was to make a sacrifice on behalf of the people for the atonement of sins before God. This is one of his primary roles, making a sacrifice. This day was called the Day of Atonement. And this day took place in the tabernacle. This was a set-apart, prepared place where they would meet with God. And this high priest had to go through a very specific process in order to meet with God. It was so specific that he did it, if he did it wrong or out of order, he would die in the process. That's how weight, weighty the presence of God was. So let me tell you three things. This isn't only three things that he did, but let me tell you three things that he did pertaining to this message. One of the first things he would do is he would make a sacrifice of an innocent animal And he would take the blood of that innocent animal and he would spread it over the blood, over the mercy seat, signifying the innocent blood covering the sins of man. So he'd make a sacrifice in the tabernacle on this day of atonement. Then the priest would take the the cup and he would light the incense, the frankincense, and it would rise up to heaven and he would signify making prayers of the people before God. So he's made a sacrifice of an innocent animal covered in the blood, he's lifting up the prayers of the people, then he would do one final thing. You've heard the the term scapegoat. He would then take a goat and he would put the sins of man, as a high priest, he's representing the people, he put the sins of man onto this goat and then they would lead the goat out of the tabernacle, out of the city, away from the people and often they would lead that goat off of a cliff. See what happens. Makes a sacrifice of blood for the people. Offered up the prayers of the people to God. And because God is holy and separate, he took the sins of man and separated them from the people. This is what the high priest would do. Now, many of you probably think that's just a weird process. Like, what is going on? Why, why would we be killing some innocent animals at God's instruction? Like, what's going on? That's just so strange, right? But here's what we must understand. Because God is just, he must punish sin. He didn't play by your rules. He set the rules. Because he's just, he must punish sin. However, God is not only just, he's also merciful. So here's the beauty of what God allowed to take place, that the sacrifices satisfied God. They sat, the sacrifice satisfied God's justice, but at the same time, it extended God's mercy. Meaning this, God enabled a way for the sins of man to be paid for by someone, or in this case, something else, in this situation, the blood of an innocent animal. Because the sins of man needed to be paid for. And instead of man paying for their own sins by their own blood, God allowed a process to which an animal would be sacrificed, which satisfied the wrath of God. However, that's the old covenant. And thank God for that. Because in Jesus, we live now under a new covenant. Or else, a part of the service, we're going to go out back and sacrifice an animal. Who brought their goats to church, you know? 
There was an old way of doing things, an old covenant that we see in Scripture of how you did things before Jesus. And now because of Jesus, the old is gone, the new has come. There is now a new covenant and a new way of doing things. And it all came through the death and the blood that was shed of Jesus on the cross. Let me show it to you. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this. For God's will was for us to be made holy. This is what he wants for you, to be made holy. How? By the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. He wants you to be holy, and you're holy by his blood. However, in the Old Testament, there was only one way to forgive sins, and it only happened once a year. It was through the sacrifice of an animal, and the problem was, because it was the blood of an animal, it satisfied God's wrath. However, it was only a temporary covering. They had to do it over and over and over again. It was temporary. Under the new covenant, under the death and bloodshed of Jesus, there's now made a way, Jesus as our high priest, that it was once and for all, it is a permanent covering. Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 says this, under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, again, because it was temporary, which can never take away sins. It was temporary. But our high priest, this is good news, church, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Jesus, as our high priest, did not sacrifice an animal for temporary covering. Instead, for our sins, he became the offering. He stepped in and he shed his own blood for the permanent covering of our sins. This is what we love about Jesus. We don't have, Jesus doesn't have to go to the cross and die again because he did it once for all. Your sins, past, present, and future. To help you understand this a little further, I want to tell you a story in the Bible, a story that some of you have, may have heard of if you've grown up in church, the story of the prodigal son. In Luke 15, we read the story about a wonderful dad who had a precarious son. And this son came to his dad and said, Dad, I want my inheritance. And the dad, being a, a good father, he gave the son what he requested. And what did the son do? The son went on into town and he wasted it all on frivolous living, just totally squandered everything. He found himself eating where pigs eat and sleep. And he thought to himself, surely my dad's servants eat and sleep better than I do. I'll go home and be a servant to my dad. So he goes home to his father. His father sees him long off, runs towards the son and does three things, each hold great significance. One, he puts sandals on his son's feet. Two, he puts a ring, a signet ring on his son's finger. And the third thing he does is he takes his robe off and places it around his son. This is what the dad did to the prodigal son. Each of them have great significance. But I want to talk about the robe for a second. In Jewish culture, the clothing of the father represented the father's authority. When, when, when the dad put his robe on the son, the son now had the dad's authority. The dad was saying, hey, community, this is my son. He's wearing my clothes. If he asks you to do something, it's as if I'm asking you to do it. Look at him the way you look at me. Jesus is our high priest when he went to the cross, he took off his robe and he placed it around you, giving you the forgiveness and the grace that you did not have and you did not deserve. But you now wear the Father's robe. Now when God looks at you, this is one of the most baffling concepts to me. When God, the Father, looks at you now, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. But yet we have it backwards. We're like, God, you, you probably don't like me much. How could, you, how could you like someone like me? You don't love me because all the stuff that I've done. Well, Jesus doesn't see that. God doesn't see that. He sees Jesus because you're wearing the Father's robe. Jesus is our high priest. Instead of making a sacrifice, he became the sacrifice. That's the first thing that he did. Frankincense has a lot of meaning, doesn't it? Here's the second thing. As Jesus is our high, our high priest, he sacrificed himself for us, and he also, he prays for us. The Bible tells us that he's sitting right next to God. Romans 8, 34, 
Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You see, the high priest of the old covenant would pray to God on man's behalf. But Jesus, as our high priest, the new covenant, Jesus is sitting right next to God. And I just, he's interceding on your behalf, but I just believe he's like, God, you see what Brian did down there? God, you see that? You see what he's doing? Like, just nudging him. Like, look at that. Isn't that awesome? Look at April down there. Look what she's doing. God, isn't that awesome? I'm proud of her. I just believe God's, he's not only interceding, but he's just like, he has the ear of God on your behalf. So he's praying for us, but one of the, the most brilliant things, plans of God in this is that Jesus walked in the flesh and he experienced everything that you can experience. So now, not only does he pray for you, but he has compassion for you. He understands what you're going through. Hebrews 4, 14 to 15 says this, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has a Ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but instead we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You see, in Jesus, we have a high priest who experienced everything you can experience firsthand. Anything and everything that you've experienced he experienced in the flesh. This is why God had to become flesh. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. Why? Because he could not separate the Godhead of him, but he had to become fully man, fully flesh, so that he could experience everything that you would experience so that he can sympathize with you and understand where you're coming from. He can relate to your trials. He empathizes with your pain. Whatever you're going through right now, maybe you're stressed, maybe you're overwhelmed, maybe you're anxious. Well, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross, he felt the same way. He was praying to God. He knew where he was going. He knew what was gonna take place and he was so anxious that he was sweating drops of blood. He was facing something so serious and so significant that he didn't know if he could go through with it. So he prayed. So he prayed. If you have friends who abandon you, friends who are not there for you when you need them most, Jesus understands. His friends denied him. They said they didn't even know who he was. If you have family that's a little crazy, anybody got some family that's a little crazy? You're sitting next to him, so don't raise your hand. (laughs) Jesus Jesus understands because the moment Jesus made the announcement to his crazy family that he's going to be Messiah, they called him a lunatic. Jesus wants you to know today that he understands because he wants you to know that he cares. Jesus, think about some of the stuff he experienced. Jesus was born out of wedlock. That's scandalous. Jesus lived in a small town. That's gossip, slander, the rumors. He was poor. He was ridiculed. He was made fun of for where he came from. Jesus was tempted by the devil in every way that you possibly could be tempted, and yet he never sinned. Jesus experienced the death of a close friend. He experienced the loss of family members. Jesus was betrayed by his friends, and worst of all, Jesus felt abandoned by God on the cross. Think about that. He wasn't, but he felt that way. When Jesus was up on the cross, giving his life for ours, just like the Old Testament talked about the scapegoat, he took all the sins of mankind, put it on himself on that cross. And because God is holy, because he is separate, in that moment, God looked away. He did not abandon him, but he looked away because he cannot be one with sin. This is why Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think oftentimes we look at that scripture, it's confusing. But here's what happened. God is separate. Jesus took on the sins of man and God looked away. 
Jesus felt that. I don't know if you ever struggle to connect with God. You feel like God's nowhere around. You struggle to be in his presence. Jesus even understands that. I heard this a while back. Someone said, well, Jesus wasn't married. But yet he is the bride of Christ that cheats on him every day. Whatever you feel, Jesus felt. Whatever you hurt, Jesus hurt. However you're tempted, Jesus experienced the same temptation. He is our high priest. He experienced anything and everything that you ever can or will experience. And he understands. He sympathizes. He gets it. He's been there. And he's the one that has the ear of God. You know, we do this as parents as well. When I was sitting down to write this message, at this very moment, not like any other point, but this very moment, my kid starts crying. Selah, my middle, was screaming in her room. And so I've got to be a dad. So I I, I leave work for a moment. I go in and check on my, my daughter. And she's laying on the floor, like all dramatic, you know, just... She's like, you know, kids are, you know, she's just laying on the floor and she's crying. And so I kind of go over there. I said, baby, what happened? And I'm trying to pick her up the floor. She's like, daddy, daddy, I stubbed my toe. <laughs> yeah, you guys feel that, you know, you get it because we've stubbed our toe before. So when our kid stubs the toe, we don't just say, what are you, an idiot? You know, like you're crazy. No, you say, baby, come here. And I picked her up off the floor and I wiped the tears out of her face and I held her. And then I prayed for her. This is what Jesus wants to do for you. In your hurt, in your pain, he's not upset with you. He's not condemning you. He's picking you up off the floor, holding you, wiping the tears from your face and saying, I understand. Let's talk to God. He's our high priest. He sacrificed himself and he prays for us. This Christmas season, let's remember to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So think about this. John 1, 14, God became flesh and dwelt among man, Jesus. And God had the, the foreknowledge to send these magi, these wise men, to come bring prophecy gifts, things that Jesus will do, gold, he is the king of kings, myrrh, He's our suffering servant. In frankincense, he is our high priest. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this gift of frankincense? Jesus being our high priest. Here's what we do, Hebrews 4, 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There he will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Back in the day, they couldn't come freely. They couldn't come boldly to the throne. They needed a high priest. But now, because of Jesus, whatever you're going through, whatever you need, you now have the ability, the freedom to come boldly before the throne of God, not because of anything that you've done, but what he has done. And as you come boldly to the throne, God says, what can I do for you? Why? Because you're wearing your father's robe. The gift of frankincense symbolizes Jesus as our high priest. And it symbolizes that he sacrificed himself for us and he's making prayers for us. So this is what I want to do today as we close out today. I want to take some time to do both of these. For some of us, we need to receive the sacrifice of Jesus. That's not, that's, that's something you have to do. It's a free gift. That's salvation. That's receiving the sacrifice. If not, you're still counting on your own blood to pay for your own sins. But there's one who's already done it for you. So you got to receive the sacrifice. Here's the second thing. Is you got to come boldly before the throne of God. You got to pray to Jesus and know that he's interceding on your behalf. So I just got to ask, when was the last time you came boldly before the throne and you talked to Jesus? 
I got five minutes left. I'm going to take two and a half minutes, and I want you to pray. Would you bow with me? Two and a half minutes of you coming before the throne boldly. Just come with your, your needs, your questions. Come with your desires, your wants, your praises, your thanks. If you don't know what to say, just start talking just like you would to a friend. Then know that he's interceding on your behalf. Let's take two and a half minutes and just talk to God. Father, forgive us if we ever take lightly the sacrifice that you made for us so that we can have a relationship with God. Thank you that we can come boldly before the throne of God every day and that you're gonna be faithful to hear us, to intercede on our behalf, to talk to God on our behalf. Lord, may we keep this in mind Many years ago, they couldn't do this. But because of Jesus, we can do this every day. I thank you that our relationship with God has been restored. So thank you that you hear us. That you're not a distant God, that you are near to us. The Bible says he's nearer to you than you think. He's closer than you think. And finally, with our heads bowed there, I just want to talk about that second purpose that he sacrificed himself for us so when he sacrificed himself for us we got to receive the sacrifice there has to be a moment in your life that you just declare by faith that you receive the sacrifice of God you receive the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for you to acknowledge that you were born sinful that you are separated from God Through Jesus, you take on his robe, you take on his sacrifice, and you receive the relationship of God once again. If that's you today, if you've never prayed a prayer like that, I want to lead you this morning to prayer between you and God, beginning this relationship, making a declaration of faith this morning. Right where you're at, just say, Jesus, I know that I'm sinful. I know that I'm separated from God. But today I receive your death on the cross so that I can be one with God once again. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you for dying in my place so that I didn't have to. Thank you for shedding your blood. And today I give you my life. Would you change me and make me new? And I commit to following you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we clap and celebrate those who prayed that prayer? Amen.